Muslims give billions of pounds in charity every single year. In the UK alone, in Ramadan, Muslims give 100 million pounds. Naturally, when you've got such a vast industry with money sloshing around, employing thousands of people, it's going to be open to exploitation. And it seems every Ramadan there's at least one big charity scandal. And what do these charity scandals actually hinge upon? Usually, it's self-enrichment or overhead fees. The problem is that when you give to charity, not 100% of it actually goes to charity. You have a portion that goes to admin fees, operational expenses and salaries of the charity employees. You can see the potential conflict here, right? The higher the salaries and admin fees, the better it is for the charity, but then the worse it is for the donors. So is it ever right to have admin fees, overhead fees? If so, what is the right amount? And what about all these charities that have 100% donation policies these days? Are they the charities to give money to? Join me in this video as I talk to some of the leading charities in the Muslim sector, and I share my own findings about this explosive, sensitive, but incredibly important subject. If you're new to this channel, Islamic Finance Guru, or IFG for short, is an Islamic investment and personal finance platform where we help you compare, analyze, and review all the latest and greatest products that are coming out of the Islamic finance and investing world. Our mission is really simple. We wanna help Muslims everywhere get wealthier and put their money to work. If that sounds like it's up your street, then please do like this video, please subscribe to the channel, and please feel free to share this video with your friends and family. And if you'd like to ask me any questions or thousands of like-minded others, then please join our Telegram groups and join the community. Let me explain to you why people care so much about overhead fees. If someone comes to you and says, brother, I'm raising money for a well in Africa, or brother, I'm raising money for a women's shelter in the UK, and you give him 50 pounds, you expect that 50 pounds to go to a well in Africa or a women's shelter in the UK. But imagine if you then found out that only 40 pounds went to these causes and actually 10 pounds went to that brother's pocket for his salary. You would feel somehow, I don't know, cheated, right? But in my humble view, that is an intuition, that's a gut feeling that is misplaced because there is very much a place and a need for overheads and admin fees in the charity sector. Let me explain to you some of the reasons why I've come to this view. The first and most important reason why overheads are allowed in zakat and charity is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows it in the Quran itself. There are eight categories where zakat can be spent and one of them is actually the people who look after the zakat. He says in the Quran, إِنَّمَا الصَّدَقَاتُ لِلْفُقَرَاءُ وَالْمَسَاكِينُ وَالْعَامِلِينَ عَلَيْهَا that charity, zakat, is for those who are poor, those needy people. And then the third category is those who administer that zakat, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed it. Let's now hear from Iqbal Naseem, the National Zakat Foundation CEO. Whenever people raise this issue, usually the first thing I say to them is, well, Allah himself supports admin. So what's your problem? Basically, you know, in the context of the zakat, by the way, Right. So of the eight categories of zakat, the third is the amilin, the workers. Allah is telling you, use some zakat to pay the workers. The idea of, you know, using zakat to do that nowadays for people is like, oh, no, 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 no. Wait, that's, this might be something wrong with that. Rather, Allah is encouraging it because he knows that part and parcel of the way to develop and build these things is you're, you've got to support the infrastructure for these things to happen. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow someone to administer zakat and get paid for that? Well, because zakat requires someone to do nine to five jobs that it requires someone to look after the money, it requires someone to hunt and find out where to give that money. I mean, take the analogy of this garden, right? This park. Of course, it's all very natural, but at the same time, you've got a gardener. At the same time, you've got police who do circuits of this park. At the same time, you've got someone who manages the sports field. There are always going to be people who need to administer something that is at heart a natural thing. Let's now hear from Tufail Hussain, the CEO of Islamic Relief, on what he has to say on these points. Well, look, it costs to deliver aid. Let me use a, a very simple intervention as an example. Uh, food, food packs. To, for you to send money abroad, it costs. Abroad, you have to get somebody to source food prices, to purchase the goods, to package the goods, and then to deliver. For that, you need manpower, you need packaging, you need uh, vehicles, you need fuel. There is a cost. 
The second key reason why you allow overheads with charity is because you want to be able to hire the best people for this charity to administer it. You know, look, I run a business and the way I think about it is if I am not happy to hire someone for my business, then why would I hire that same person, ad, you know, give that same person the trust to administer millions of pounds of zakat? And I would only hire people who are good and good people need money to survive, right? Because they've got lots of other options. You can't realistically expect someone good to work for free for long, long periods of time and make it their sole focus. It's just not realistic. General Muslim perspective, or the Muslim yeah. donor perspective, seems to be that, um, that there's something wrong with that. Now, the problem is uh, the expectation of the masses ends up governing the way in which a lot of charities end up thinking about their own organizations. And then it almost, and then charities themselves feel perhaps the pressure not to, or to include certain costs in certain areas, just to make the numbers look, uh, uh, look the way that the, uh, that the kind of the donor would want to see them. Yeah. And this is the problem. So basically, you know, it's not, there's we're sort of subject to basically the populist kind of mentality on these things. And which doesn't necessarily lead to best outcomes for anybody, not the beneficiary, not the donor, not the charity. So that's the that's the issue. You also don't want just people who are part timers or volunteers because for them, Zagat isn't necessarily their sole focus and it might be low down their priority list. You want someone who's focused on this big task at hand. This is the third pillar of Islam. And you want someone who is really going to be hardworking, smart, efficient, uh, you know, well connected and can deliver this in a really powerful way. By the way, I'm not saying that there isn't a role for part time people and volunteers. There's a massive role for them in charity. But the point I'm making is that you always will need with larger charities and at scale charities, you will definitely need people who are working full time for it to be a viable and sustainable institution. You might be thinking, hang on, working in a charity is really simple. All you have to do is gather the money in and then just give it out. But it's not as simple as that. You need someone who's actually good at the sales and the marketing to actually gather that money in. You need someone who works out where to deploy that money. You need someone to work out who best and most efficiently to deploy that money to. You need to work out what you're going to do with that money vis-a-vis -vis that person. Are you just going to give it to him or are you going to do other things with that person, build long-term projects? You need someone to do the operational side of things if you're going to spend that money abroad. You need someone to look after the finances and the accounting. You need someone who's good at the management of this entire organization now. You need someone to be able to hire people to do this charitable work regularly. And the list goes on and on and on. I've even talked about the technology people. I've not talked about the people who deal with regulation and the charities commission and the legal stuff. There's so much stuff that is very specialist, that you and I will not be qualified to do. You need to hire in people for that. The third key argument why overheads are needed is because you often need proper infrastructure to be able to deliver that charity to the place that you need to deliver it. Let me give you an example, right? Let's say you want to raise 5,000 pounds for a well in Africa. Now, practically, how do you actually deliver that? It's not as simple as collect up 5,000 pounds, send it to Africa, and somehow miraculously a well will get built. How practically does it happen? Firstly, you need to get over to Africa to deliver that money. So that's 500 pounds right there. Secondly, you need to be able to live there for the next two weeks just to suss out the land and work out where the best place is to give that charity. That's gonna cost you another 500 pounds. Thirdly, you might have some permissions or regulation or compliance or local government people that you have to talk to to get the permission to do charitable work. That might cost you another 200, 500 pounds. Then finally, you need to work out where am I actually gonna give in this foreign land that I know nothing about, where am I actually gonna give this money to create a well where you know that it will be most needed. I don't back you or me to do this well in two weeks. Right? But let's say you somehow miraculously find that place. Then you're going to have to hire a company to do that work. They're probably going to rip you off because you don't know the market rate. You probably don't even speak the language. At which point you're going to hand over that money and then you're going to scurry back to the UK. You don't really know if that company's done a good job, if people are using that well. All you've done is you've created a well in Africa that who knows if anyone is actually using. Oh, and by the way, you might fall ill as well. Who pays for that? Are you going to pay for that? Or is the charitable money going to pay for that? So as you can see, building a well in Africa and taking 5,000 pounds for that is not as simple 
as, you know, paying 5,000 pounds and then just sending it over into this black hole that is Africa. There is a real practical element to all of this as well. The fourth key argument why overheads are needed is because you need people in who are good at administering and safeguarding and making sure that the money that is being spent is properly looked after and it's very transparent what is happening with that money. But for people to do that, they need to be experts in anti-money laundering, anti-bribery. They need to be au fait with the law and compliance. They need to have accountancy backgrounds as well. They need to know how banking works and how payment flows work. Do me and you know all of that stuff? Not necessarily. So that's another key reason why you need to spend in order to make sure that your zakat is administered and looked after in a proper way. Okay, Ibrahim, I get it. Some charities need to have overheads, fine. But isn't it still better to have 100% donation policies where that can be achieved? Let's now hear from Osama Mezwi, the Penny Appeal USA CEO. There is no such thing as 100% donation policy. It just doesn't exist. Meaning that there are there is a cost of overhead. You've got processing fees, credit card fees, you've got banking fees, um, you've got transportation, you've got logistics, you've got rent, utilities, you name it. There is no way that a charity can, can uh, adhere to 100% uh, donation policy. What they can do is find a subset of donors that are willing to underwrite all overhead fees, which is noble, which is fantastic. So my thoughts on this are that 100% donation policy is great and it should be encouraged, but only for those charities that have a business model that allows them to achieve that. Ummah Welfare Trust is a great example of this and they have a 100% donation policy. Here is how they explain in this diagram how this works for them. Ummah Welfare Trust is a big organization and really, mashallah, doing great work. The way they handle their administration side of things is they look at four key areas to get that money in. Firstly, people will give them money directly for admin fees. Secondly, they will look for gift aid. So gift aid is a UK government policy where they top up 25% of UK taxpayer money um, so that if they donate £100, you actually end up getting £25 extra that the government kind of tops up. So Ummah Welfare Trust benefits from that and they will use that for their admin fee, that £25. Then Ummah Welfare Trust have two commercial endeavours as well. They've got their charity shops and they have their recyclable clothing business as well where the, all of the old clothes that you donate to them, they get that recycled and sold off as well. So these are the two commercial projects that Ummah Welfare Trust uses to fund its charity. Both of these commercial endeavours might not seem like they'd be massive, but actually the charity shop business and the recyclable clothing business are large multi-billion pound industries. So there is actually some decent profit to be made here that can, mashallah, sustain people like Ummah Welfare Trust and other charities who use these business models. Also, very importantly, notice how both of these commercial endeavours that Ummah Welfare Trust and other charities use are actually reliant on our donations still, right? We're not donating money to charity shops or recyclable cloth banks. We are donating our stuff. We're donating our household stuff, we're donating our clothing. That is still money, it's just in an asset form, not a money form. So these charities are very much still charities and they do rely on us to be able to support that. And it might not feel like the same thing, it might not feel like we're giving money and therefore that's going to overheads, but we are still giving them money in the form of a jeans or in the form of a t-shirt. That must not be forgotten. Some people say that, look, actually, hang on, 100% donation policies are great. And look at all these smaller charities. My mate runs a charity and he does all the great work that a big charity like, I don't know, Islamic Relief or Muslim Hands or Muslim Aid does, um, but with no overheads. But the problem with that is look at the number of people he's helping. He's helping five or 10 people from his local village. And sure, he can do that because he has a direct connection with them. And by the way, that's great work. I'm not knocking that at all. But you should not compare that to the work that you know, an Islamic Relief or Muslim Hands, Muslim Aid, Human Appeal, all these guys do, which is at a massive scale, that they're trying, helping thousands and thousands of people. In fact, I think I was reading um, you know, some of the larger charities, they help millions of people every single year. You can't do that without administrative fees. They're somehow low costs and 100% donations mean, necessarily means impact. It doesn't necessarily mean impact in the sense of the quality of the service. It might do, it, it, may, it may be the case, 
it might not be the case you know so the, these things need to be um thought thought through a little a little bit more carefully and i know it's hard because actually most people don't have the time or the inclination to go and do the research yeah, yeah. So are 100% donation policies necessarily better than those charities who don't have them? I don't necessarily think so. I think people who have 100% donation policies, that's great. And it should be encouraged that charities should, as much as they possibly can do, try and become sustainable uh, business models themselves, right? I definitely encourage that. But for some charities, that doesn't make sense because each charity does different work. It's got different people behind it and it has a different level of scale as well. So for some charities, it might make more sense to just charge the overheads as part of the donation as opposed to having a separate wing that does the commercial stuff. Um, for each charity, it's different. No is a simple answer because the charity sector has lots of things it can improve on too. The first thing that Muslims should watch out for when giving to charities is that there are a lot of scammers and fraudsters out there who claim to be from a charity or set up their own charity, but then just take that money and do a runner with it. Secondly, and I know I've said that there is a place for overheads, but there is also such a thing as excessive overheads and frivolous spending. When you look at the numbers, and I said, look at the Charity Commission numbers and the accounts, you know, you should be looking at program spending of more than 70%. If you're seeing that a charity has less than 70% program spend, I think there are some questions that need to be answered. There may be some justified question answers, and that's okay. There might be a unique year where programs are delayed. A charity is not able to spend as much money as it would like on a programs, for example. That happens in, in, in certain exceptions. But generally, you know, if you're a donor, you're looking at the Charity Commission, Look at 70% or higher program spend. I think that's healthy. Thirdly, accountancy and governance and transparency isn't necessarily great across the charitable sector. There needs to be prompt on-time filings to the Charity Commission with the annual reports. It needs to be very clear where charities are spending the money and not try and hide it within you know, clever accountancy strategies or uh, you know, wording and paragraphs and what have you. Just be very clear where this money is going and how it's being spent. And then finally, there needs to be a degree of accountability about salaries. In my view, I think they should be very open and clear what the salaries are. But then also Muslims should have an understanding that, you know, good salaries is not necessarily a bad thing as well. Fourthly, the charitable sector needs to be really careful about when it uses third party providers like accountants, social media agencies, video experts and what have you. All of these people if they are you know, linked to the charity or the people who are involved in the charity and there's a little bit of nepotism going on, you need to be very careful about that because that isn't necessarily fair. It doesn't mean that the charity is getting the best value for money. If, for example, it went out to five other social media agencies, it could get a better quote. And that's obviously better for uh, Muslims who've donated to that charity. So this is something to watch out for as well, to make sure that the charity is quite transparent about its processes when it comes to hiring out people. You need to get to know the nonprofits that you're investing in. Only through actually having a relationship with them and asking questions and getting to know their leadership and their management, are you then going to really understand their decision-making process? Fifthly, the charitable sector has seen a huge explosion in smaller charities. And look, becoming a charity and doing charitable stuff is great. But my concern is that a lot of these charities seem to be reinventing the wheel where other charities are already doing this kind of thing. It doesn't make sense to re-establish a supply line to a remote village in Pakistan to get them food and sustenance when another charity has already done that. Why would you create extra overheads? Why would you spend that thousands of pounds creating that supply chain to that well or to that village or wherever it is when another charity has already done that? Why don't you just give it to that other charity and they will deploy it rather than creating double the overheads? So with smaller charities, I would encourage people to look at if they're doing something very unique and really support that because that's great. But if they're doing something that is very samey to the other charities, uh, I'd be a little bit more cautious about that. Sixthly, the other key thing that charities need to work on is making sure that they are spending on impact and long-term projects as opposed to just short-term emergency relief. Short-term emergency relief is really important, but if that's all that we do, then we don't necessarily 
create a world where you know those poor people get actually out of poverty for the long term and for the better we need to be able to invest in education we need to be able to invest in infrastructure to help people get back on their feet and also by the way we need to be investing in charities themselves in the Oqaf projects in the long term charitable fund projects so that these charities can invest that money and make profit from it and then use that profit to then spend in charity as well but the problem is we don't necessarily as a community appreciate the value of that and so charities struggle to raise money for their Oqafs as well so this is something that we should really be focused on if you see uh, if you see programs such as uh, sustainable solutions like microfinance programs, um, income generation projects, um, and uh, uh, etc., then 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 you know that this is an organisation that is more beneficiary led. These are types of in, you know in, interventions that are normally very difficult to fundraise for, but it shows that really they are still, despite the challenges of raising funds for them they are doing what's right for the people that we serve. Oof, what an intense video. Look, ultimately, Muslims are and should be charitable during Ramadan. That's the bottom line. But the way we are charitable should be impactful and it should also be focused on what the charity is actually doing as opposed to just get taken in by the simple marketing on the face of it. We shouldn't get too hung up about 100% donation policies we should get hung up about a charity's transparency about what it does with our money and its ability to actually deliver that aid to where it says it's going to be delivered. We should be generous this Ramadan and give with our money, but we should do so intelligently. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.